If anyone else has ever wondered what or why some Jews don't believe in Yeshua as their savoir. Here is one of the texts I found while studying. I just want to reiterate. They're Jews that know Yeshua is the savior of the world. I'm sharing to help others be able to combat lies that others might tell them. This is in no easy to push hatred of any kind. I believe we are both Jew and Christian part of the covenant. And we are all at different levels. So let's remember. God is always watching. Blessings and prayers. Marie. Jesus and Chazel. Jesus and Chazel. Me. Bimash Isaacson. Jesus and Chazel. Jesus and Chazel. Me. Bimash Isaacson. Bayer Ha Gra Shulchanaru Yore Dia 147-3. Dot, colon. In the second century many Jews believed that Jesus had learned magic in Egypt. This is already believed by Celsus who debated with Origen in the late 2nd century, Origen, Contra Celsum, I, 28 http colon slash slash legacy dot tyndale dot cam dot ac dot uk slash tyndale slash staff slash instone brewer slash prepub slash 07 underscore instone underscore brewer dot pdf colon Sanhedrin 43a colon 20 The Mishnah teaches that a crier goes out before the condemned man. This indicates that it is only before him, i.e., while he is being led to his execution, that yes, the crier goes out, but from the outset, before the accused is convicted, he does not go out. The Gemara raises a difficulty, but isn't it taught in a Bereita, on Passover Eve they hung the corpse of Jesus the Nazarene after they killed him by way of stoning. And a crier went out before him for forty days, publicly proclaiming, Jesus the Nazarene is going out to be stoned because he practiced sorcery, incited people to idol worship, and led the Jewish people astray. Anyone who knows of a reason to acquit him should come forward and teach it on his behalf. And the court did not find a reason to acquit him, and so they stoned him and hung his corpse on Passover Eve. Colon. Sanhedrin 43a colon 21-26 Ula said, and how can you understand this proof? Was Jesus the Nazarene worthy of conducting a search for a reason to acquit him? He was an insider to idol worship, and the merciful one states with regard to an insider to idol worship, neither shall you spare, neither shall you conceal him, Deuteronomy 13 9. Rather, Jesus was different, as he had close ties with the government, and the Gentile authorities were interested in his acquittal. Consequently, the court gave him every opportunity to clear himself, so that it could not be claimed that he was falsely convicted. Apropos the trial of Jesus, the Gemara cites another Bereita, where the sages taught, Jesus the Nazarene had five disciples, Mattai, Nikai, Netzer, Bunny, and Tota. They brought Mattai in to stand trial. Mattai said to the judges, Shall Mattai be executed? But isn't it written, When, Mattai, shall I come and appear before God? Psalms 42 3. Mattai claimed that this verse alludes to the fact he is righteous. They said to him, Yes, Mattai shall be executed, as it is written, When, Mattai, shall he die, and his name perish. Psalms 41 6. Then they brought Nakai in to stand trial. Nakai said to the judges, Shall Nakai be executed? But isn't it written, And the innocent, Naki, and righteous you shall not slay, Exodus 23 7? They said to him, Yes, Nakai shall be executed, as it is written, In secret places he kills the innocent, Naki, Psalms 10 8. Then they brought Netzer in to stand trial. He said to the judges, Shall Netzer be executed? But isn't it written, And a branch, Netzer, shall grow out of his roots, Isaiah 11 1? They said to him, Yes, Netzer shall be executed, as it is written, But you are cast out of your grave like an abhorred branch, Netzer, Isaiah 14 19. Then they brought Bunny in to stand trial. Bunny said to the judges, Shall Bunny be executed? But isn't it written, My firstborn son, Benny, is Israel, Exodus 4.22? They said to him, Yes, Bunny shall be executed, as it is written, Behold, I shall kill your firstborn son, Binka, Exodus 4.23. Then they brought Tota in to stand trial. Tota said to the judges, Shall Tota be executed? But isn't it written, A psalm of thanksgiving, Tota, Psalms 101? They said to him, Yes, Tota shall be executed, as it is written, Whoever slaughters a thanks offering, Tota, honors me, Psalms 50.23. Colon. Gitin 57a colon 3. Onkelos then went and raised Jesus the Nazarene from the grave through necromancy. Onkelos said to him, Who is most important in that world where you are now? Jesus said to him, The Jewish people. 
Ankelos asked him, Should I then attach myself to them in this world? Jesus said to him, Their welfare you shall seek, their misfortune you shall not seek, for anyone who touches them is regarded as if he were touching the apple of his eye. See Zechariah 2 12. Colon. Gitin 57a colon 4. Ankelos said to him, What is the punishment of that man, a euphemism for Jesus himself, in the next world? Jesus said to him, He is punished with boiling excrement. As the Master said, Anyone who mocks the words of the sages will be sentenced to boiling excrement. And this was his sin, as he mocked the words of the sages. The Gemara comments, Come and see the difference between the sinners of Israel and the prophets of the nations of the world. As Balaam, who was a prophet, wished Israel harm, whereas Jesus the Nazarene, who was a Jewish sinner, sought their well-being. Colon. Sotah 47a colon 13 to 14. When he came back to Eretz Yisrael, Rabbi Yahashua arrived at a certain inn. The innkeeper stood before him, honoring him considerably, and over all they accorded him great honor. Rabbi Yahashua ben Puraya then sat and was praising them by saying, How beautiful is this inn! Jesus the Nazarene, one of his students, said to him, My teacher, but the eyes of the innkeeper's wife are narrow, teratah. Rabbi Yahashua ben Puraya said to him, Wicked one, is this what you are engaged in, gazing at women? He brought out 400 shofarot and excommunicated him. Every day Jesus would come before him, but he would not accept his wish to return. One day, Rabbi Yahashua ben Puraya was reciting Shema when Jesus came before him. He intended to accept him on this occasion, so he signaled to him with his hand to wait. Jesus thought he was rejecting him entirely. He therefore went and stood up a brick and worshipped it as an idol. Rabbi Yahashua ben Puraya said to him, Return from your sins. Jesus said to him, this is the tradition that I received from you. Anyone who sins and causes the masses to sin is not given the opportunity to repent. The Gemara explains how he caused the masses to sin, for the Master said, Jesus the Nazarene performed sorcery, and he incited the masses, and subverted the masses, and caused the Jewish people to sin. Colon. Sanhedrin 107b 8. The sages taught, always have the left hand drive sinners away and the right draw them near, so that the sinner will not totally despair of atonement. This is unlike Elisha, who pushed away Gehazi with his two hands and caused him to lose his share in the world to come, and unlike Yahashua ben Puria, who pushed away Jesus the Nazarene with his two hands. Colon. Colon. Barakat 17b colon 1. There is no breach, that our faction of sages should not be like the faction of David, from which Ahitophel emerged, who caused a breach in the kingdom of David. And no going forth, that our faction should not be like the faction of Saul, from which Doeg the Edomite emerged, who set forth on an evil path. And no outcry, that our faction should not be like the faction of Elisha, from which Gehazi emerged. In our open places, that we should not have a child or student who overcooks his food in public, i.e., who sins in public and causes others to sin, as in the well-known case of Jesus the Nazarene. Colon. Sanhedrin 103a 14. Alternatively, the phrase no evil shall befall you means that you will be frightened neither by bad dreams nor by evil thoughts. Nor shall any plague come near your tent means that you will not have a child or student who overcooks his food in public, i.e., sins in public and causes others to sin, such as in the well-known case of Jesus the Nazarene. Colon. Avoid Azara 17a 1. And you derived pleasure from it, and because of this you were held responsible by heaven. Rabbi Eliezer said to him, Akiva, you are right, as you have reminded me that once I was walking in the upper marketplace of Sipori, and I found a man who was one of the students of Jesus the Nazarene, and his name was Yaakov of Kefir Sekanya. He said to me, It is written in your Torah, You shall not bring the payment to a prostitute, or the price of a dog, into the house of the Lord your God, Deuteronomy 23 19. What is the halakha? Is it permitted to make from the payment to a prostitute for services rendered a bathroom for a high priest in the temple? And I said nothing to him in response. Colon. Avoid Azara 17a colon 2 to 3. He said to me, Jesus the Nazarene taught me the following, it is permitted, as derived from the verse, for of the payment to a prostitute she has gathered them, and to the payment to a prostitute they shall return, Micah 1 7. Since the coins came from a place of filth, let them go to a place of filth and be used to build a bathroom. And I derived pleasure from the statement, and due to this, I was arrested for heresy by the authorities, because I transgressed that which is written in the Torah, remove your way far from her, and do not come near the entrance of her house, Proverbs 5 8. 
remove your way far from her, this is a reference to heresy, and do not come near the entrance of her house, this is a reference to the ruling authority. The Gemara notes, and there are those who say a different interpretation, remove your way far from her, this is a reference to heresy and the ruling authority, and do not come near the entrance of her house, this is a reference to a prostitute. And how much distance must one maintain from a prostitute? Rav Hizda said, 4 cubits. To Sefta Chian 2 to 6. Dot dot. Dot. Colon. Colon. Shabbat 104b colon 5. We learned in the Mishnah, if one unwittingly scratches letters on his flesh on Shabbat, Rabbi Eliezer deems him liable to bring a sin offering and the sages deem him exempt. It was taught in a Bura'ita that Rabbi Eliezer said to the rabbis, didn't the infamous Ben Shtata take magic spells out of Egypt in a scratch on his flesh? They said to him, he was a fool, and you cannot cite proof from a fool. That is not the way that most people write. Incidentally, the Gemara asks, why did they call him Ben Shtata, when he was the son of Pandira? Rav Hizda said, his mother's husband, who acted as his father, was named Shtata, but the one who had relations with his mother and fathered him was named Pandira. The Gemara asks, wasn't his mother's husband Papos ben Yehuda? Rather, his mother was named Shtada and he was named Ben Shtada after her. The Gemara asks, but wasn't his mother Miriam, who braided women's hair? The Gemara explains, that is not a contradiction. Rather, Shtada was merely a nickname, as they say in Pumbedita, this one strayed, set at da, from her husband. A well-known anti-Christian treatise called Toldot Yeshu which can be dated to the 10th century but contains materials that can be dated back to the 2nd century. Excerpts In the year 3671 inches the days of King, Yanai, a great misfortune befell Israel, when there arose a certain disreputable man of the tribe of Judah, whose name was Joseph Pandera. He lived at Bethlehem, in Judah. Near his house dwelt a widow and her lovely and chaste daughter named Miriam. Miriam was betrothed to Yohanan, of the royal house of David, a man learned in the Torah and God-fearing. At the close of a certain Sabbath, Joseph Pandera, attractive and like a warrior in appearance, having gazed lustfully upon Miriam, knocked upon the door of her room and betrayed her by pretending that he was her betrothed husband, Yohanan. Even so, she was amazed at this improper conduct and submitted only against her will. Miriam gave birth to a son and named him Yahashua, after her brother. This name later deteriorated to Yeshu. One day Yeshu walked in front of the sages with his head uncovered, showing shameful disrespect. At this, the discussion arose as to whether this behavior did not truly indicate that Yeshu was an illegitimate child and the son of Anitta. Moreover, the story tells that while the rabbis were discussing the tractate Nezikin, he gave his own impudent interpretation of the law and in an ensuing debate he held that Moses could not be the greatest of the prophets if he had to receive counsel from Jethro. This led to further inquiry as to the antecedents of Yeshu, and it was discovered through Robin Shimi and Ben Shetta that he was the illegitimate son of Joseph Pandera. Miriam admitted it. After this became known, it was necessary for Yeshu to flee to Upper Galilee. Lions of brass were bound to two iron pillars at the gate of the place of burnt offerings. Should anyone enter and learn the special ineffable name, when he left the lions would roar at him and immediately the valuable secret would be forgotten. Yeshu came and learned the letters of the name, he wrote them upon the parchment which he placed in an open cut on his thigh and then drew the flesh over the parchment. As he left, the lions roared and he forgot the secret. But when he came to his house he reopened the cut in his flesh with a knife and lifted out the writing. Yeshu proclaimed, I am the Messiah, and concerning me Isaiah prophesied and said, Behold, a virgin shall conceive, and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. The insurgents with him replied that if Yeshu was the Messiah he should give them a convincing sign. They therefore, brought to him a lame man, who had never walked. Yeshu spoke over the man the letters of the ineffable name, and the leper was healed. Thereupon, they worshipped him as the Messiah, son of the highest. When word of these happenings came to Jerusalem, the Sanhedrin decided to bring about the capture of Yeshu. They sent messengers, Ananui and Ahaziah, who, pretending to be his disciples, said that they brought him an invitation from the leaders of Jerusalem to visit them. Yeshu consented on condition the members of the Sanhedrin receive him as a lord. He started out toward Jerusalem and, arriving at Nob, acquired an ass on which he rode into Jerusalem, as a fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah. The sages bound him and led him before Queen Helene, with the accusation, this man is a sorcerer and entices everyone. Yeshu spoke up, Madam, I am the Messiah and I revive the dead. A dead body was brought in, he pronounced the letters of the ineffable name and the corpse came to life. The queen was greatly moved and said, this is a true sign. 
she reprimanded the sages and sent them humiliated from her presence. Yeshu's dissident followers increased and there was controversy in Israel. Then the sages selected a man named Judah Iscariotto and brought him to the sanctuary where he learned the letters of the ineffable name as Yeshu had done. When Yeshu was summoned before the queen, this time there were present also the sages and Judah Iscariotto. Yeshu said, It is spoken of me, I will ascend into heaven. He lifted his arms like the wings of an eagle and he flew between heaven and earth, to the amazement of everyone. The elders asked Iscariotto to do likewise. He did, and flew toward heaven. Iscariotto attempted to force Yeshu down to earth but neither one of the two could prevail against the other for both had the use of the ineffable name. However, Iscariotto defiled Yeshu, so that they both lost their power and fell down to the earth, and in their condition of defilement the letters of the ineffable name escaped from them. Because of this deed of Judah they weep on the eve of the birth of Yeshu. Yeshu was seized. His head was covered with a garment and he was smitten with pomegranate staves, but he could do nothing, for he no longer had the ineffable name. Yeshu was taken prisoner to the synagogue of Tiberias, and they bound him to a pillar. To allay his thirst they gave him vinegar to drink. On his head they set a crown of thorns, there Yeshu remained until the eve of the Passover. Yeshu was put to death on the sixth hour on the eve of the Passover and of the Sabbath. When they tried to hang him on a tree it broke, for when he had possessed the power he had pronounced by the ineffable name that no tree should hold him. He had failed to pronounce the prohibition over the carob stalk ten, for it was a plant more than a tree, and on it he was hanged until the hour for afternoon prayer, for it is written in scripture, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree. They buried him outside the city. The sages desired to separate from Israel those who continued to claim Yeshu as the Messiah, and they called upon a greatly learned man, Simeon Kepha, for help. Simeon went to Antioch, main city of the Nazarenes and proclaimed to them, I am the disciple of Yeshu. He has sent me to show you the way. I will give you a sign as Yeshu has done. Simeon, having gained the secret of the ineffable name, healed a leper and a lame man by means of it and thus found acceptance as a true disciple. He told them that Yeshu was in heaven, at the right hand of his father, in fulfillment of Psalm 110.1. He added that Yeshu desired that they separate themselves from the Jews and no longer follow their practices, as Isaiah had said, Your new moons and your feasts my soul abhorreth. They were now to observe the first day of the week instead of the seventh, the resurrection instead of the Passover, the ascension into heaven instead of the Feast of Weeks, the finding of the cross instead of the new year, the feast of the circumcision instead of the Day of Atonement, the new year instead of Hanukkah, they were to be indifferent with regard to circumcision and the dietary laws. Also they were to follow the teaching of turning the right of smitten on the left and the meek acceptance of suffering. All these new ordinances which Simeon Kepha, or Paul, as he was known to the Nazarenes, taught them were really meant to separate these Nazarenes from the people of Israel and to bring the internal strife to an end. Colon. Dot. Mishnah Sanhedrin 10-2. Three kings and four commoners have no share in the world to come. The three kings are, Jeroboam, Ahab, and Manasseh. Rabbi Yehida says, Manasseh does have a share in the world to come, as it says, 2 Chronicles 33 13, and, Manasseh, prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him, and heard his supplication, and brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. The sages, said to him, to his kingdom he brought him back, but he did not bring him back to life in the world to come. The four commoners are, Balaam, Doeg, Akatophel, and Gehazi. Colon. Sanhedrin 106b 2. A certain heretic said to Rabbi Hanina, Have you heard how old Balaam was when he died? Rabbi Hanina said to him, It is not written explicitly in the Torah. But from the fact that it is written, Bloody and deceitful men shall not live half their days, Psalms 55 24, this indicates that he was 32 or 34 years old, less than half the standard 70 year lifespan. The heretic said to him, You have spoken well, I myself saw the notebook of Balaam and it was written therein. Balaam the lame was 32 years old when Pinehas the highwayman killed him. See Ephraim Urbach, Rabbinic Exegesis about Gentile Prophets and the Balaam Passage, Hebrew, Tarbitz, 25-1956, pages 272-289.